have some 227 new members of parliament and five members who have re-entered the House. This is, it's true, a slightly smaller intake than that of 1997, but still it represents more than a third of the whole House, a figure which in itself constitutes a massive turnover. We have 143 female MPs, the highest such total ever. While many women would still contend, and as a matter of fact they would of course be right, that this remains an underrepresentation of 52% of the population. And my wife would be foremost amongst those making this argument. The total does represent a quantum leap from the mere 19 female members 30 years ago. Furthermore, some 31% of new MPs are female and drawn quite evenly between what we used to describe automatically as the two major political parties. Class of 2010 also includes more members from an ethnic minority background, with 16 new MPs here, again drawn evenly from the Conservative and the Labour Party ranks. We now have the first female Muslim MPs, three of them, the first black female Conservative MP, the first Asian British female Conservative MP, and the first African British female MP. Again, there is a case to be made that this is only the first step towards a parliament that more accurately reflects the Britain of today, but let me remind you that in 1980, there were no MPs from an ethnic minority background whatsoever. This is real change, and I cannot but believe, Peter, that if a member of the esteemed parliamentary lobby to which you belong had fallen into a coma in 1980 and awoken only this week, and there are one or two of them <laughs> who sometimes offer that impression, they would be absolutely staggered by the change which they would encounter on the green benches were they to take the trouble to look into the chamber. Add to that the arrival of several openly gay MPs from across the spectrum, plus representatives from the Green Party and the Alliance Party in Northern Ireland for the first time. And what you have is little less than a quiet revolution in who now sits in the House of Commons as a member of Parliament. As far as the Speaker's Conference is concerned, I did have the pleasure of sitting on it as a backbencher and then taking over as its chair, although most of the hard work was done by Anne Begg, a brilliant thing. I agree with what the conference decided. I studied the report very carefully and submitted a few thoughts about it. We had good evidence sessions. I remind colleagues, of course, Sarah will remember all this, but others might not. We had very good evidence sessions with all sorts of organisations. The conference also wanted to talk visits across the country and learned a great deal about the underrepresentation of women, ethnic minorities, people with disabilities, and indeed the challenges faced by the LGBT community as well. And I am very keen that it should be implemented. Now there may be some matters for Parliament, there may be some matters for political parties, and I think it's extremely important, I know Anne's already done some work on this, that the allocation of responsibility is explicit and accepted, and the progress then happens. All parties sign up to it, and I mentioned all these witnesses we had. We also had, of course, as witnesses, Gordon Brown, David Cameron, and Nick Clay. And each of them competed with the others in enthusiasm, both for the concept and for <coughs> the direction of travel of the conference. So let us make it happen, and as much of that should happen as quickly as possible certainly in the lifetime of this